penitential order begins on page 351 of the Book of Common Prayer. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise. That among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. reading from the book of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. 
Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me. The jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and still be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, 
I do not consider that I have made it my own. But this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining ahead, forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. 
The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. In today's first lesson, we heard the prophet promise that the Jewish people were going to be set free from their Babylonian captors. They were promised that after they would go home to Jerusalem. Redemption and salvation was on the horizon. They were promised that something altogether new was about to happen in their lives as a people of God. A change was going to come. The prophet says, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Although the circumstances are very different today than those that Isaiah addressed over 2,500 years ago, it seems to me that we have been seeing and experiencing something new as a people of faith, however slow it may seem. Let's go back a little bit in time and talk about this particular thing. Back in March of 2013, uh, Justin Welby became the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he received scant attention in the national and international press. Now, as the Archbishop of Canterbury, he became the first among equals to the other bishops within the Anglican Communion. The Archbishop of Canterbury in his office symbolized the unity of the bishops and local churches for some 86 million Anglicans found in the 165 countries around the world. A better appropriate title would be Cat Herder in Chief <laughs> because those of us who have cats know how well they respond to anything that claims authority. Now, one of the things about Welby is, is that he's a long-standing member of the community of the Cross of Nails, which is an international community dedicated to the church's work of reconciliation. The reconciliation that's the never-ending work to help restore all people to unity with God and with each other in Christ, just as we promise in our baptismal covenant. Over the years, Welby's sense of renewal for preaching and teaching the gospel by word and deed to all people and to care for all of God's creation has, well, at times been slow, depending on who you are, but it has been consistent all the way from England to Africa and around the world. Now, getting much more attention in that month that Welby became the Archbishop was, as you may recall, the election of Pope Francis. For more than one billion Roman Catholics around the world, Pope Francis became the head of their church and was formally enthroned on March the 19th of 2013. Now, Francis is a Jesuit, a member of the Society of Jesus. Generally speaking, Jesuits are deeply spiritual, highly educated, and progressive thinkers. And for the last 16 or 17 years, my two spiritual directors have been Jesuit priests. So yes, I am biased, I admit that. 
One of the more pronounced things I have learned and respect about the Jesuits is their willingness to be vulnerable and their real deep-seated sense of humility. This has been one of Francis's most consistent and greatest character traits, it seems to me. You may remember that after he was elected and he came out on the balcony to greet the people on the piazza below, he sort of walked, he walked out in this plain white cassock. There was no ermine collars around him and I couldn't see if there were any red slippers, but I don't think there were. And he walked out wearing the same cross that he had worn as a bishop. He hadn't grabbed one on the way out the door that was more ornate. And he walked out on the balcony and sort of awkwardly looking, waved at the people and said, Buena sera. Good evening. And then he did something rather profound. He asked the people for their prayers. And then he prayed for them. Now, because of the closeness of the dates of their enthronements, neither Justin nor Francis were able to attend each other's celebrations. However, delegations from both Rome and the Anglican Communion to include our own Episcopal Church were present at both of these milestone events. And since that time, Justin and Francis have done much to improve relations between our two communions. As recently as 2017, the two communions, through the work of the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, declared that, now this is pretty amazing, we both said we could learn something from each other. We Anglicans were, were encouraged to learn about models of unity from the Roman Catholics, and we do continue to try to learn what unity looks like with all of our provinces. And the Roman Catholics were invited to consider, well, how the laity can be, be better involved in decision-making and the potential for female deacons and the regularly priestly ordination of married men and the authorization of laypersons to preach. Well, actually, some of that has been set in motion already, and more changes are coming. Later this year, Francis and Justin will hopefully make their COVID-delayed joint trip to, the South, to South Sudan to help contribute, as they may, to the peace process. In each year of his papacy, since it began, we've seen media coverage of Francis on Monday, Thursday, washing feet. And he's generally gone into jails and the prisons there in Rome and washed the feet of inmates to the shock and horror of some traditionalists. He's washed and kissed the feet of Muslims, girls, women, a Muslim converting to Catholicism, and a Buddhist. He's gone to the home of the elderly and disabled, washing the feet of the lay residents to include an Ethiopian woman and another Muslim. Now in today's gospel, in today's gospel proclamation, we heard that Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. This event in one form or another is recorded in all of the Gospels, all four Gospels. In both Matthew and Mark, it's an anonymous woman that anointed Jesus' head before Passover. In Luke's version, it was an anonymous woman, well, a woman of the streets, it's implied, that anointed his feet and wiped them with her hair. However, they are recorded, let's just say that Mary was it, was the person. Mary's act was an act of love. It was an act of devotion. It was a, a vulnerable act of intimacy. 
Yes, it was an act that foreshadowed Jesus' washing the feet of the disciples just a few nights later at the, at the Last Supper, as well as the preparation of his corpse. In all the variations of the story, the woman acted selflessly. Her acts made her vulnerable. There were acts of humility. There were acts in the holy space of intimacy. Intimacy, intimacy is, is, a, is consecrated space, even if we don't recognize it at the time when an intimate moment occurs. It really becomes set aside. It becomes a special space. The holy space of intimacy is where life is created through tenderness, through passion, pleasure. The holy space of intimacy is where life and relationships are nurtured. It is that space where hurt and pain are met with compassion and reconciliation. The holy space of intimacy is found in anointing the sick in preparation for approaching death's portal. It is entering into that sacred space with a dying person and with God that can, well actually I think is the most holy space that one can be in. The holy space of intimacy is that space we experience on Monday, Thursday, when a member of the clergy or another person washes one another person's feet, sometimes anointing them and kissing them. That is an intimate, intimate, holy time and space that is life-changing, can be life-changing for all who enter into it together. The holy space of vulnerability and intimacy is a necessary space, the kind of space for our Christian traditions separated for centuries to take the time to honestly know and trust each other enough to repent and to reconcile. So speaking of Jesuits, remember it's only been about 500 years ago during the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation that we were burning them at the stakes in England, hunting them down in people's houses, dragging them out of the hidey holes, all in the name of Christ, of course. Those were fellow or ancestral Anglicans. So yes, there's much to repent for. There's much trust that has to be regained. And I believe that, I believe that God has been doing something new for us as a church, for us Anglicans and Roman Catholics, and frankly, for the greater church, separated by, for centuries. We have leaders found in Justin Francis and Michael Curry, and just to name a few of the major leaders. We have these leaders who have the traits of humility and vulnerability like that found in Mary's anointing the feet of Jesus. A willingness to take a chance, a willingness to take a chance of being rebuked or received. Now that's not just happening at the global level either. For example, when I was rector at Ascension in Frankfurt, Bishop Stowe, the Roman Catholic Bishop of Lexington, twice preached from the pulpit at Ascension. The first time was 
when we held the service for the people murdered in the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. The second time was during the height of the refugee, refugee crisis a few years ago. And Bishop Stowe was there along with Bishop White from Kentucky on the first time, and then our own Bishop Mark the second time. And on the third occasion, Bishop Stowe joined Bishop Mark in the altar party and participated in my retirement service and spoke the service at which, the even song at which Mother Laurie officiated. And yes, there was smoke. <laughs> Bishop Mark noticed that there was one spot where he could see the wall, and he told her. But, you know, these, these sorts of events were, once upon a time, fairly rare. But it also, in our case, marked the first time a Roman Catholic bishop had ever set foot in the pulpit at Ascension and been behind the rail. It may have also been the first time in this diocese that ever happened, where a Roman Catholic bishop stepped inside the pulpit and was in the altar party on three different occasions with another bishop in a gathering with a bunch of Protestants. That took a willingness to be humble and vulnerable, to allow the sacred intimacy to be created and shared on each one of those occasions, something new happened. Something new continues to happen because Bishop Mark and Bishop John continue to collaborate very closely. And we seem to have both lay and ordained leaders emerging who are humble enough to bow down and wash the feet of the poor the powerless and the sinful and embrace all people and people, leaders who reflect a deep abiding relationship with Jesus. I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that this renewal of leadership leads the rest of the church, small and writ large, to be humble enough to fully embrace every human being as a child of God who is worthy of our unconditional love and respect. And as we are drawing towards the end of the season of repenting, that is what repentance looks like, is to be vulnerable, to be willing to change direction turning towards God, turning towards unity with each other and with each other in God. As Francis called for the people on the piazza to pray for him, let us respond daily in offering up our prayers for Justin and for Francis and for Michael and for Mark and for John. and the leaders throughout the church universal. And it's well worth being reminded that as Michael Curry reminds us over and over again, if it's not about love, it's not about Jesus. This is our way, the way of love. And we are called, we are a people, we are a people of God trying to follow the way of Christ and we are called to try and love as Mary loved. We're being called into something new for God is doing a new thing. Amen. Amen.
Let us stand as we are able and reaffirm the words of our faith in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Prayers of the people this morning are found in our service bulletin. With confidence and trust, let us pray to God for the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, especially the churches in the Diocese of Lexington, that in faithful witness we may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. Let us pray to God, Lord of compassion, in your mercy, hear us. For peace in the world, especially in Ukraine, and places torn by war and violence at home and abroad, that a spirit of respect and reconciliation may grow among nations and peoples, let us pray to God, Lord of compassion. In your mercy, hear us. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for those who have asked our prayers, and for refugees, prisoners, and all in danger, that they may be relieved, comforted, and protected, let us pray to God, Lord of compassion. In your mercy, hear us. For those whom we have injured or offended through our thoughts, words, and deeds, let us pray to God, Lord of compassion. In your mercy, hear us. For grace to amend our lives and to further the reign of Christ, let us pray to God, Lord of compassion. In your mercy, hear us. In communion with all those who have walked in the way of holiness, especially Betty Jo, Jeff, and all who have died whom we love. Let us pray to God, Lord of compassion. In your mercy, hear us. God, our creator, in your love and goodness, you have taught us to come close to you in penitence with prayer, fasting, and generosity. Accept our Lenten discipline, and when we fall, fail by our weakness, raise us up to your unfailing mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
Good morning, and we welcome those of you who join us in person and online uh, as part of our great community of prayer. I'm Laurie Brock, the rector of St. Michael's, and I'm very excited to announce that after 747 years, the county of Fayette is finally in the green with COVID. Yay! So what that means for us, because our vestry uh, decided at the May meeting that we would, uh, we would continue to require masks when we gather in the large group for worship for two weeks, that on Maundy Thursday, on Maundy Thursday, mask will be encouraged but not required. So, and this is, a, this is in the hallway chat with a couple of doctors too. So uh, I, I, will, I want to really impress upon all of us that we don't get to make judgments about whether people decide to keep their mask on because we don't often know the full story. So remember that little bitties cannot yet be vaccinated and we also have many people in our communities and in our congregations who are living with or caring for somebody who may be at particular risk. So, um, so Maundy Thursday, if you come to that service, masks are be optional um, and just know that and continue to take care of yourself. Oh, by the way, they're optional only if you're fully vaccinated. So if you're not fully vaccinated, you can just wrap yourself up like a mummy and continue to come to church. <laughs> so uh, tonight we will have our final Lenten program on icons of faith where uh, we will actually engage in prayer, praying with an icon, a way, and then we'll have some prayer stations. So if you join us, probably about 10, 15 minutes of conversation, and then we'll just have time in prayer, and when you're finished, you can leave, and it will also be online, so please join us for that. Um, and one more quick thing is uh, kept for this, and then I get, so I'm gonna apologize in advance for the second sermon here. Uh, Kevin Martell invited me to remind you all that we would love for you to sign up to be a holy mower, so if you would like to donate some of your time uh, during the week, depending on how many we have, there's a sign-up sheet out there. Now for Holy Week and Easter. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, which marks the beginning of Holy Week, which is the holiest week of the Christian year. And uh, in line with Jesse's sermon about we're going to try some new things, we haven't done this in person in two weeks, so we're going to do some new years, stuff. Years. 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 <laughs> I should not be allowed to be unsupervised on most days. Um, we are going to gather next Sunday, not in the parking lot, but across the hall in the parish hall. Um, and that's going to match up too with the vigil. But some of that is an awareness of, I don't want to deal with the weather. We're all singing like glory lot in honor on 17 different notes, but also a sense of of what does it mean to reclaim this whole building as holy space. Um, but we'll have chairs in there for those of you who don't want to stand, but we're gonna gather in there and then we will come in here for the Palm Sunday service. Uh, then we will continue Holy Week with our usual Wednesday Eucharist at one o'clock. Uh, Maundy Thursday is at 6.30 and we will have um, the Holy Eucharist with foot washing, the stripping of, altar, of the altar. And from the end of the Maundy Thursday service until midnight, we will, you will, can come into the church and pray and be present. Uh, we will then lock the doors from 12 and it will open again at seven in the morning for anybody who wants to maybe to come in before work and then it will end at noon before the Good Friday service. If you would like to come in and pray between the hours of midnight and seven, we can make that happen. You just need to call me so that I can give you a code to get in the church. So I realize there are people who might want to come later or earlier, but we try to sort of balance safety. Good Friday services are at 12.30 and 6.30. Holy Saturday is at 10.30, April 16th. And then the great vigil is at 6.30. And it also too will start in the parish hall. I'm so excited not to have to worry about weather for, you know, but uh, we will start that. That service, um, which is on Saturday, we will have a reception after that. So if you uh, are, wanna come to that, you are invited to bring um, some appetizers that people can eat, um, whatever that needs to look like to you. It would be helpful if you didn't bring like a tuna casserole that we actually have to serve, but like, you know, small things people can pick up and eat. And then Easter Sunday, 8.30, 10.30, our hospitality committee has lost their minds. So we will have 
Uh, but you don't have to bring food to that. that. Because of COVID and the numbers were still high, we are actually getting that uh, catered, but we will have the brass and it'll all be glorious and, and hopefully mask and courage, but optional, all that good stuff. There's a lot to do. And one of the things I love about the Episcopal Church is that it's not just my job or Jesse's job, it's our job to commemorate Holy Week and Easter. So there's a lot of, of places that you all can have a role in. If you'd like to be a lector, usher, intercessor, choir, um, there's a sign-up sheet out there on the bulletin board. I encourage you to sign up, even if you've never done it before, we'll help out. We also have a cleaning day on Saturday, April 9th from 10 to 1. Our altar guild coordinates that. Uh, we will have tasks for all physical um, capability levels. And so if you need to sit down and do work, we have work that you can sit down and do. If you want to do something that probably, you know, makes me want to call our insurance company, we got that. So uh, if you'd like to help, it'll be from 10 to 1. If you can only come an hour, that's fine too. So please join us for that. And then we also are going to have wonderful, beautiful, and as much as we can, sustainable um, Easter flowers that can then be replanted on our garden. So if you'd like to make a dedication in honor, in thanksgiving, or in memory of someone, you can either go online to our website, and it has a little tab at the top that says Easter flowers, or there's nice hard copies of forms out on the table in the lobby. You can get one of those, fill it out, put it in the offering plate, drop it in the office, or just call or email the office. We need your information by Holy Wednesday at noon. Um, you can donate after that, but we're not going to get it in the bulletin then because there are 7 million bulletins to print between now and then, and I'd like to get some sleep. So that is your second sermon, all getting ready for Holy Week. I'm so excited that we get to do it in person. I can't stand myself. And... Uh, I'm just so excited that we all get to make that journey of love and glory and, dare say, singing hallelujahs together for the first time in two years. Uh, that is a reminder that God is always doing new things, even when we're really tired of the old stuff. Are there any, is there any announcements I missed, first of all? I hope not. Are there any birthdays or anniversaries to celebrate today? Everybody awkwardly looks around. No. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
We continue our worship with Eucharistic Prayer A on page 361. Please stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. And gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity 
constancy and peace, and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Bow down before the Lord. Look down in mercy, Lord, on your people who kneel before you and grant that those whom you have nourished by your word and sacraments may bring forth fruit worthy of repentance through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.